You came here for the gaming benchmarks. You could have just navbed to a few websites and checked graphs, but you decided to click on this video and I appreciate that. So we're gonna jump straight into it. In this video, the Ryzen 7 3700X was put through the ringer in a couple of different formats. First, a stock configuration bundled with a Gigabyte X570 Aorus Master. This was the motherboard used for our 2700X as well. A separate video will be uploaded within the week pertaining to our X470 testing, and then another for a few B350 and 450 boards with supporting UEFIs. The the second config for the 3700X included a manual overclock. Now, how far could I go? Well, you might be just a little disappointed, at least with my sample. Uh, seems I didn't win the silicon lottery here. 4.3 gigahertz at 1.41 volts, a turbo lock load line calibration and aggressive VRM preset. Not much more I can do here. And 4.4 uh, gigahertz wasn't gonna happen. I was pushing one point, almost 1.5 volts. So yeah, but who knows, you might get lucky and I'm sure other viewers had different, albeit probably similar outcomes. Now, the same XMP profile was configured for every tested CPU you'll see in this video. That's the 2700X, 3700X, and 9900K. 3.6 gigahertz for our 16 gig kit of dual channel Trident ZDDR4 from G-Skill. This should be a sufficient combination of high frequency and low cast to benefit infinity fabric latency dependencies as they pertain to both our 2700X and 3700X, although the implementations are slightly different due to the shift in architecture and SOC layout. Our graphics card of choice was NVIDIA's RTX 2080. This particular variant is from ASUS and it was reviewed in this video right here if you're interested. The boot drive utilized was a 2TB MP600 from Corsair, which is a PCIe 4 compatible M.2. The operating system was reinstalled for each CPU swap, that's Windows 10 Pro, to eliminate software and driver conflicts, and all games were loaded from a 2TB WD Blue hard drive. All right, with all of that out of the way, let's dive into the benchmarks. Here are a couple of synthetic tests for a frame of reference first. In Cinebench R20, our 2700X fared single and multi-core scores at stock of 433 and 4097 respectively. Not bad. This is with core performance boost enabled, which effectively allows your CPUs to reach rated boost speeds out of the box without violating power limits. Disabling this would be the near equivalent of disabling turbo boost and Intel CPUs and no one's gonna do that. Now with a manual 4.2 gig overclock, our single core dropped slightly. That's a phenomenon we explained in a previous video, which you can check out right here. However, our multi-core rose to 4,223. The 3700X though, radically improved things across the board. At stock, things jumped by 61 points to almost 500, and when overclocked, a score of nearly 5,000 was achieved. The 9900K, the previous single core champ, retains its lead, but only slightly at 509. This was with MCE or multi-core enhancement disabled, by the way. Our manual overclock to five gigahertz across all eight cores picked things up just a bit, but it is worth noting that the 3700X comes awfully close to matching Intel's core i9. Geekbench 4 was the other synthetic I wanted to run before games. Here a similar result holds. The Core i9 was a bit faster overall in single core test, but the gap AMD's narrowed here with this launch is definitely showing and worth noting. In 3 d Mark Time Spy, the 2700X's CPU score came back at 8584 at stock, 8857 when overclocked. A similar margin was observed for the 3700X, albeit with higher scores overall. Now interestingly enough, the 9900K scored lower at stock than the 3700X in this test after averaging three runs. This flip-flopped in our overclock scenarios with the 9900K squeaking out a nearly 300 point lead, but had our 3700X been a better overclocker, I imagine the red team would have taken this one as well. Grand Theft Auto 5, while optimized fairly well, has always been a bit Intel biased. However, the tides have definitely turned with this latest launch. The 3700X averaged 147 FPS at stock, only 12 FPS lower than the 9900K at these very high frame rates. Considering this title's inherent preference for the latter, I I'd say this is a pretty darn good result. Frame times indicate similar degrees of micro stutter. The one thing I'd call odd though is the fact that this game performs significantly better overall at stock in our case uh, for the 3700X, right? So our lowest 0.1% of frames average 13 FPS lower when overclocked, suggesting heavy use of one or two cores. And under such situations, the chip's max boost clock of 4.4 gigahertz would come in handy. It's only 100 megahertz delta, but it 
it can help. I'm gonna take it if I can if I can get it, right? Our testing confirms that it rarely hits this frequency, but the smoothness of this title at stock is undeniable. Shadow of the Tomb Raider yielded interesting results. The 3700X came out on top overall, but struggled slightly under harsher loads, hence the slightly lower 95% averages. Ultimately, side by side, it'd be near impossible to tell these two apart. Actually, I'd be willing to say it's impossible. They, they, they both look really good. And that's a good thing because the 3700X is significantly cheaper than the 9900 K currently, and significantly better than the 2700X in this particular title. Resident Evil 2 is next here without a doubt AMD CPU can take the cake. In fact, I averaged higher frame rates for the 2700X than I did with the 9900K. This is running through the exact same checkpoints in the game, so I tried to get this as repetitive as possible. At stock, the 9900K really struggled by comparison, although I doubt anyone's really going to complain about a 200 FPS average. Overclock scenarios, by the way, fared better across the board in the balanced preset. Now another game I like to test because it struggles constantly with optimization parameters is PUBG. 1% and 0.1% lows tanked hard in this case, and you could see, I mean, just by how hard they tank, that these CPUs really struggle to handle adverse situations in games where optimization is subpar. Intel won on the lower end with dips that weren't as steep overall, but the 3700X kept up and nearly matched the blue team for the overall average and lowest 1% of frames. Basically, what this graph tells us is that all three chips had infrequent stuttering issues, the 9900K just didn't stutter as hard for as long. This is a deal breaker if you're you know, a PUBG junkie? In my book, no. The AMD CPU would still be a fine choice. I tested Fortnite to appease the younger audience, or majority of the people playing would probably be younger. I absolutely hate this game, and I only play it for benchmarking purposes, so if you have to excuse my slow mechanics, you please do so. I landed on top of the same building every time and I ran the same route. I also tried to sync up the time of day in game because some games tend to perform worse or better and at night. So on average, the 9900K edged out a victory, but again, only by a few FPS. This trend continues to the lowest 0.1% of frames. So I highly doubt anyone would be able to distinguish the two here, even with frames being drawn on screen. I should also note that our 2700X fared pretty well here and suffered only slightly among the lowest 0.1% of frames when manually overclocked. So if you're a huge Fortnite fan, and that's pretty much all you play, and maybe you're into streaming or something similar, the 2700X at a deep discount, which we expect these prices to continue to drop just as the original Zen did, this chip might be worth considering over the more expensive processor. So it's just food for thought. You have alternatives out there. Now Witcher 3 tends to be more graphically intensive than anything else with a few exceptions, and our narrower margins reflect this. Every CPU fared well in the high preset in 1080p. The 9900K came out on top by around 7 to 10 FPS, but this is really nothing to flip out about when we're you know in the 200 FPS range on average. Perhaps more importantly, the lowest 1% and 0.1% of frames. The 3700X nearly matched the 9900K for the lowest 1% and fell just shy among the lowest 0.1%. Visually, you'd be hard pressed to discern the two, so I'd call this a tie. F1 2017, though a couple of years old by this point, still exhibits a solid balance between multi-core and single-core optimization, tends not to be as rough as F1 2018 in my experience. 3700X averaged between 175 and 177 FPS on average compared to 190 and 193 for the 9900K, although the former absolutely crushed the latter among the lowest 0.1% of frames. Now, I'm not entirely sure what went wrong here, but this occurred several times with no outliers at all, right? So that's why I included it. I'm not going to keep those results from you. I just, I haven't fully understood why the Core i9 did so much worse here. Typically, it's the better CPU. I feel really bad about this next benchmark because it absolutely crushed every CPU we threw at it. Universe Sandbox 2's Earth and Many Moon simulation wrecks pretty much every CPU on the market to an extent, and you can see our thread utilizations were pretty high throughout. The 9900K averaged 71 FPS when overclocked, but dipped to an average of 18 FPS for the lowest 0.1% of frames. The 3700X had a lower overall average, but struggled to the same extent under the worst conditions, namely when the moons orbiting Earth first collide, and that looks like this. Yeah, pretty choppy. Obviously, this was the most intense section of the benchmark. Lastly, Ashes of a Singularity CPU benchmark reveals just how big a difference frequency can make. 59 versus 48 might seem small on paper, but remember, we're talking about lower frame rates overall, so the deltas percentage-wise are greater, and you'd probably be able to see the difference on screen. The 9900K took this one with ease, but let's be real. I mean, 
how many of you actually play Ashes of the Singularity? So that's that. Now I know I could have tested the 9700K, probably would have been a better price comparison with this chip here, but the point is this chip competes with Intel's $450 CPU. I mean, almost neck and neck throughout. And this is considerably cheaper. You're gonna save around 100, 150 bucks with this chip here. The 3800X is also an option, a bit higher boost clocks out of the box, potentially um, more overclocking headroom. But in a nutshell, I mean, if this is anything like Zen Plus or even the original Zen lineup, the 3700X is going to be probably the better bargain. I mean, if you wanna pay another 50 bucks for an extra 100 or so megahertz, be my guest, but I'm not seeing these things overclocking much more than around 4.4, 4.5 if you're really lucky. So yeah, I mean, the obvious conclusion that I've come to is that AMD's done a heck of a job with the 3700X. Power draw is incredibly low. Package power topped out at around 100 watts, and I was reading around six to seven amps under full load across the clamp meter. This is a 65 watt TDP chip after all. The seven nanometer lithography works wonders for temperatures as well. While gaming, this thing re remained under 70 degrees. Actually, it was easy to stay under that. Sometimes it was under 60 degrees Celsius, if you can believe that, with our Kraken X62. It's a 360 millimeter AIO after heat soak, and it idled well under 40 degrees Celsius, confirmed through hardware monitor, MSI afterburner, and CPU-Z. So really the only thing I can complain about here is the overclocking potential. And I talked to a few of the reviewers prior to launch, and most of them expressed similar disdain with this. Now I had, and we gotten this to like 4.6 or 4.7 gigahertz across all eight cores, this thing would have slayed the 9900K in nearly everything. But as of right now, we've got one heck of an octa-core CPU here for a little over 300 USD, and that'll save you over a hundred bucks. Again, when foregoing the 9900K, it'll almost break you even compared to the 9700K, but the 9700K doesn't have multi-threading or Intel's hyper-threading. This does, SMT baked in 16 threads in total. It's gonna be a heck of a productivity CPU as well. So going forward, it's gonna be difficult to recommend Intel's 14 nanometer stuff. I mean, the presence of an IGP is definitely a plus for a few niche circumstances, which we'll explain again in our productivity benchmark video. But for a majority of you who game, stream, and content create with a discrete GPU, the 3700X is an incredible value. It really is. It, it's honestly what Intel should have priced their latest eight core CPUs at. If the 9900K was a little over 300 bucks, like the old school i7s and, well, this is the first i9, but you know what I mean, then it would be a toss up. And at that point, I would probably still promote the 9900K is the better CPU to buy because you're also getting an IGP in there and that's just an added bonus for people, again, that do some productivity work that requires it. But at this price, I mean, you're getting so much performance. It's, it's, it's impossible. I mean, it, for me, it's, it's very difficult to recommend an equivalent Intel CPU. What I mean by equivalent is something with a similar number of cores and similar performance in game. So yeah, I mean, until Intel does something about its prices, there's there's no way. I mean, gamers should almost exclusively consider Zen 2. Stay tuned for our 3900X review, by the way, because that's going to be interesting as well. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this one, click that like button. And by the way, stay tuned. Uh, again, for subsequent rising coverage coming in the next few days, the, the 3900X is coming up next. Uh, and I'm sorry I had to break this up into two videos. There's just a ton of stuff to do and I wanted to get this out on launch day. Uh, so stay tuned for the 3900X review tomorrow, but we've got other stuff. We've got the Navi stuff coming. We're doing a lot of really cool experiments with these CPUs so you guys can see how far these can go. And we're gonna look at uh, power and voltage, um, you know, the relationship between both of those uh, when we overclock and see how that varies from chip to chip. We're also gonna be testing these CPUs in B350 and B450 boards for those who have those boards currently and maybe don't want to upgrade motherboards. I don't blame you. Uh, so we're going to test a lot of that stuff. Stay tuned for all that. Again, click the subscribe button if you're interested, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. This is Science Studio. Thanks for watching again, and thanks for benchmarking with us.